Hi everyone and welcome to the new Media and Film Studies Instagram account and more importantly a new series we're going to be doing on here called Media and Film Masterclasses. In this series I'm going to be interviewing a number of media and film industry professionals, asking them about how they got into the industry, what their actual job is in the industry and about some of the work that they've done in the past. Uh, this week on our first ever Media and Film Masterclass, we're going to be talking to uh, production designer Mark Tildesley, who um, is one of the top production designers working in the industry today. He uh, has worked a lot with filmmaker Danny Boyle on films such as uh, 28 Days Later and Sunshine, with Michael Winterbottom on 24 Hour Party People, with Fernando Moreles on The Constant Gardener and The Two Popes. Uh, he's also made films such as Snowden, Phantom Fred, uh, Train Spotting 2, and most recently he was the production designer on the new latest yet to be released James Bond film, No Time to Die. Uh, this is my chat with Mark Tildesley. So, uh, yeah. Could you start by just like explaining to everyone what actually a production designer is? What do you do on a day-to-day -day basis on a film set? Okay. So um, production designer is the um, person that is the is responsible for the aesthetic look of the film. Right. Um, and so he runs or he or, he or she is normally the, the, the head of what we call the arts department. That's, um, and within that department, there are a number of different mini departments. So within an art department, there are various things like the set deck department, prop department, construction department. And so, um, and, and then, uh, so the production designer has to manage, is in control of all those things. But we have, I have a team of people that help. And basically, uh, my normal role is to cause chaos each day. Yeah. Um, and then let people sort it out. Yeah. By the yeah. end of the day, it's been resolved. So, um, and that's an important thing about being a production designer. Uh, is that you are there to have great ideas yeah? and you're there really as a very close friend buddy hopefully to the director mm -hmm. so you're probably of all the crew on the film you're the, the you know, normally the producer starts with the script and the ideas um, and they hire a director and the next person that they usually hire is the designer and so I'm on, you know, a designer is on quite early in the process of making a film. And so they call that in pre-production or pre-pre-prep. And at that point, you'll have, um, you'll be given the script to read and then you'll have cre really initial creative discussions just about the whole concept of the film with the director and how you might, you might uh, achieve it visually. And, and so each different, each director has a different approach. So if you're working with, and I'm lucky to work with some great people. So if you're working with Danny Boyle, he comes with a giant stack of books and right. loads of little paper slips inside it. Where, and, and when you open up these images, without doubt, a number of these uh, will be in the final product, in the film. A number of those images, not verbatim, but you know, you, I will know exactly where that reference point came from. So, so, um, so Danny comes with uh, as a director in that relationship with a huge amount of visual ideas, which is great. Uh, other directors turn up with nothing and are clueless visually, and uh, you have to steer them very carefully through the whole process. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess that's why someone like with Danny Boyle you've worked on a number of his films right so he's going to want someone that he trusts someone that he's used yeah. before yeah yeah that's true so so um that, that's what happens after a time is that that relationship becomes hopefully if it goes well that relationship uh blossoms and and the next time you come to this convers this early conversation you're straight in you know there's no uh no messing around you don't have to have any small talk you go straight to the point and you can say what you feel like. I don't really think that's very good. When I first met Danny Boyle, was for, uh, the first film I did with him was 28 Days Later. Yeah. yeah. And um, I, I don't know, I was young and foolish and buoyant. And I went in and all of these ideas, I thought the script was, you know, 
pretty hopeless and needed some work and all that stuff but, which i would not say now because i'm just yeah. you know it's the old diving ball process i can't yeah. <laughs> you can jump off a 10 meter board when you're young and foolish because <laughs> you don't know how much it hurts anyway i basically um said to him i thought that the the, the opening of the script was rubbish yeah and, and i literally I thought uh, afterwards, in hindsight, as I left the meeting, I thought, oh, I'm blowing that, you know, I blew it. Because I, 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 um, they were like gobsmacked. The writer was in the room as well. Yeah, and they were like, oh, and the producer, and they were like, wow, okay. Um, but I got a call, you know, by the time I got to the tube station, I had a text saying, yeah, um, you know, uh, we'd like to like, talk to you further. So so sometimes, yeah, so there's that, that, that boldness there came out of not, not really understanding the situation. Yeah. So, anyway, you should always say what's in your heart, you know, Absolutely, without freaking yeah. people out. And so, so that's how it starts. You go and meet the director, and um, and and sometimes, a lot of, still, I still go and interview, but not very often these days. You don't necessarily interview, but when I first started out, you go to an interview, so, and you go with loads of, you know, you 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 read the script and break it down. And the lesson I've learned in turn doing these interviews and stuff for people, if you're ever going to do this for a living, is the best thing is to let the director shoot first. Yeah. So don't um, when you go in, the point of it is that he, they're looking, the director, he or she is looking for a, a creative colleague or a buddy. Yeah? Someone can tell them the truth and all the rest of it, but they're looking for someone that's going to be their ally and you really are i mean literally you sometimes have to get into a huddle in a room against the entire production world and work right. out what to do so um and, and so the things i say is, is is don't i used to go in with loads of ideas you know I used to go and say look what about this and this and that you but the danger of doing that is that you're not listening to what the director is thinking you're you're, you're pitching a fresh idea without any knowledge of what they're thinking so mm -hmm. normally now what I do is I say, um, I don't take a folio in with all my images in and stuff. I, I, I just I ask them. I say, look, what's your vision for this film? Yeah, and what do you what do you feel? And 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 then they, once they open up with their answer on you know how they feel the film's going, then I know what of my thoughts and material I should unleash. So yeah. so um, yeah, so that's my that's my. Um, my trick about getting work and I've been really successful. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, getting some good jobs on that basis of really just really starting a conversation with them, which is really how you're going to go on, which is you're going to listen to what they're saying and try and work something out. Not yeah. With yeah. 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 Uh, so yeah, so that's, um, so then, so the, I don't know if I've answered this all, but production designers role is running the art department, being the creative chaos, having ideas, being brave, you know, like you've got to really stay with them. You know, people people try and uh, dilute your ideas and you just go, go no, yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah. you keep going. Without being stupid or foolish, obviously some things are impossible. But, you know, there is a way to solve issues and there is a way to make something happen. And, um, uh, yeah, so then the next question, the next thing is that production design is only as good as the team of people that they select to work with them. I'm really literally like a sort of, I am just steering a group of incredibly talented people. Right. Uh, and, um, and I'm good at presenting their ideas and then making them my own, you know? <laughs> yeah. You see this idea? It's brilliant, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. And it's getting the awards. But, yeah. He's like, I pick up the awards, dust them down, do that stuff. <laughs> but yeah, so I have a really, really great creative team and I'm really, Shall I talk about Joe? The roles, the next, the, the person, the people that are, they're all important, but there's a, a very special role in um, a set decorator, which is, oh, yeah, set decorator yeah. is almost like another designer, but they deal with a slightly different, um, they deal with a slightly different. So the set decorator is dealing with the sort of the, the, the looking after the section that was be all the furniture, the wall coverings, the carpets. Uh, any smalls like pens and paper or quills or ink you know all that well that which is the world that is really under scrutiny in uh, in in the camera so what a, we would call the mise-en-scene as uh, a group of media analysts exactly <laughs> the mise-en-scene and it's so true right it's like it's like no point in designing a fantastic set 
when you're in a two shot close up situation that's all about a piece of paper and a pen. Uh, 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 if the pen doesn't look good or it's a rubbish looking set, the uh, desk and all the rest of it, then you know, you're wasting your time. So the set decorator's role is really important. And then you, um, so I, I work with a couple, but I work with, the, at the moment, a lady called Veronique Melray, who's a, she's from Europe. She lives in Brussels and, and Paris. And um, she's incredibly flamboyant. And I'm, I'm a, basically a sort of normal South London boy. And I, yeah. I never saw an antique in my life. And maybe, <laughs> never saw one until I was about 25. Anyway. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, things like Ikea, a band, all these, you know, any of that stuff. She's sort of a specialist. She has everything handmade or made by, you know, elves somewhere. But it is incredible. Her work is amazing. Yeah, so yeah. if you watch a film like The Phantom Fred, you'll see all that detail in that needlework and that system of how things are made. And uh, yeah, so the set decorator, really important role. Uh, and then obviously the construction of sets and stuff like that, it depends on what scale of film. Sometimes you actually don't actually build anything. You know, sometimes you're just working uh, in location where you're, you're changing the, the is, is maybe there a not process changing much. In making that decision between how you decide whether something's going to be filmed on location or in uh, a built set. Cause I, I mean, we, we took some of the students out to LA a couple of years ago. And it was yeah. incredible walking into some of these sound stages and seeing what they're building, but thinking, why didn't you just go to a house and shoot this? Why are you deciding to build this huge? Thing? Yeah, yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, so, he, he, so each creative team has a different approach, yeah? So say, for instance, like on the Phantom Fred, Paul Thomas Anderson, Daniel Day-Lewis, they're desperate to be in real locations, even though it's super painful. So the main house, was in town you know it was a, a, and it would have been an it's it's technically a lot easier to work inside a um a studio because it's warm it's dark when you want it to be dark you know yeah. so you don't have to do night shoes wait for the thing to be dark it's just dark i mean i know you can black out windows on a location but that normally happens during the day which means you can't see anything out of them and it looks particularly bad and the cinematographers don't like to do that you know they like to see a little bit of tree or life or sky or something an evening or night outside so um yeah so so someone like Paul Thomas Anderson would, and Dan Dalish would like the real place because they feel in their performance they want to touch the real thing yeah. now I could, I could assure them that I could build them the real thing in in the studio <laughs> but, <laughs> but, the it. <laughs> but it's still not the same as the real world not for someone like yeah. Daniel Day-Lewis who right. lives and breathes <laughs> that what thing yeah and um you know he'll literally go and touch things and stroke them and feel things. you know it's like this is wow um and the other the other thing about the real world is the real world is less sanitized so you sort of have to um in when you're working on location you just as a film person filmmaker you you have to react to the situation you know where what the, what the light's going to be what happens and um and it also is it has a more of a discipline on location you can't really do stupid moves where you go through the wall like in the cook the thief the wife and the lover or something you know or you right, glide right. through the walls yeah. <laughs> just yeah. doesn't happen um yeah so it sort of forms a slightly more real discipline and so you get a different feel so so as i say some creative teams love to go down that route and um, they feel safe in that world yeah and then ner- some of them are nervous about sets because it's fabricated um, mm-hmm. um and you know, but the, the 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 thing about you know, so you have to make in, in you have to make the choice, you know, about which way to go with everything, and that's, you know, um, you know, on Phantom Fred, I was desperate to build a, a, an atelier, the upstairs of the house in in the film. I was desperate to build it because the, the place we had to film it was really tricky to work in. It was in the top floor, fourth floor of this house, and it was harsh, uh, but it looked great in the end, and it got done. And I suppose in the end. You're really there to make sure that if if you don't have genius actors working, mm-hmm. you might as well give up and forget it. You know, if you if you haven't got a great film, <laughs> you can do all the all the wallpaper you want in the world, but you need a performance. Yeah. So that's the yeah. point: is without making actors into something super special, you need to protect their environment and make sure that they are them and the director are feeling comfortable as part of your job. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. 
So, okay. you know, you go, in, you go into, the other thing, obviously, if you go into studio, when you're building from the ground upwards, like if you take, say, sunshine or something like that, or um, when you have to build from the ground upwards, you, you, there, it doesn't exist. So you've got to go and build it. And so you inevitably end up in a studio. So. Yeah. Can you talk us through sunshine a little bit? Because this is, this has got to be one of the biggest sets you've had to build, right? Or is it all built in sections or do you build the whole thing? How do you go about building a spaceship from like the concept straight away all the way through to what you're actually shooting at? Okay, yeah, so, so the, the um, it's an interesting process and you know, different people do different things. Like I, we, Danny and I, in terms of getting into the mood and the mindset of what it would be like to, to make that film when you read it obviously these people are in isolation on the way to the sun which is a nonsense so it's a it's a fable from the get-go but the reality is you try and find so you try and find an earthly version of that so we went up to scotland to the submarine base and went on a nuclear submarine because we thought that was the closest thing in terms of locking people into a dark space for a long time yeah. and what that would feel like so we we literally went there and um it was really extraordinary, you know, uh, to see this young group of people managing. You know. And so, for instance, you start to see how people exercise on a submarine. You know, so they have, they had a gymnasium that was built around the missile silos. Uh, yeah. You know, so, so, so there's a language that comes about. So, so, for instance, although that is a genre that's science fiction, we, we used to say, oh, um, we'll start with science fact. Yeah. first so we'll find we'll find a we'll find something that we know that will um that is near believable because we're actually going to do a lot of lying in this film we're going to lie about that you know the, 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 the you know we had um we then um, we once we got a few ideas together we invited in um some scientists to give us some lowdown they basically tore our ideas to shreds and said it was complete nonsense yeah, yeah. um yeah but <laughs> so the bits that were still left we hung on to and kept um but it was a guy called Brian Cox who does that, that radio yeah, program. I know, I remember, yeah. He yeah, he, he, about yeah, he came in and, um, but he was very cool as well. He said, so we were trying to devise a spaceship that would go to the sun. And, you know, you start to think about that. If you're not scientific, creatively, you think, oh, God, you know, you're going to have a, you need a shield against the heat, yeah? So the shield's yeah. going to be some great big chunking steel door. And then when you talk to Brian Cox, he tells you that, no, if you, the sun would obviously eviscerate everything for miles when it got near yeah. it. So but the only chance you'd have of getting close at all would be to um, have multiple layers of very thin, super reflective gold. Mm -hmm. um, and he said, you know, almost like a sort of golden umbrella, but multiple layers. And then what happens is the heat hits that. And it will go, it'll go through it because it's, it will be thin enough to permeate it. And then it will go to the next layer and it will cool down until it gets back to where you're living right. on the ship. Yeah. Anyway, so, so you start to learn all these facts and that and gather ideas from real life and do these things. And, well, and then, um, you know, then you realize you've got to build a set that's the size of 19 football pitches okay. and you haven't even got a football pitch to build it in. So yeah. that's when you start to look at the use of, of um, visual effects and and and, and uh, you know uh, I mean wherever possible in our in my filmmaking process of design and, and with most of the directors I work with, we try and every do everything in camera until it's impossible so yeah. we try and keep it in camera and then you go no call the call in the CG <laughs> here we yeah, go yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah so then we um, yeah so the process so then we sort of um, yeah, we also we also we also watched other people's films. I I I, I after after making Sunshine, I went to meet Ridley Scott, um, wow. who who was making Prometheus, yeah, or had just made Prometheus, yeah, and um, I told him that I stole all his ideas from Blade Runner, yeah, yeah. and he told me that he stole all of my ideas from Sunshine. He said he watched <laughs> it and nicked all of them. So. So in terms of that idea, that genre idea of having such original ideas, there's not that many super original ideas. It's just the way you present them. And, um, uh, you know, I think in, in Sunshine, we wanted to try and keep a reality on it, but also so I have a beauty. And I think what we tried to do was to keep the sun, which was such a beautiful image, the, the heat and the, of the sun, we tried to keep that to a minimum so that when it, 
when you saw it in the film visually, it sort of almost arrested your eyes or burnt your right. retinas out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So because you'd been in, it's like you know when you're in a dark room and someone turns the light, bright light on. That yeah, one. Yeah. So, so there was that idea that there would be this magnetism of, of being insanely drawn towards this stupid mission, and that we would do that by um, having so. And I have to say, Alvin Kushler, who is the cinematographer, the, the, he's the DOP, and in, he's in charge of camera and lighting. He he melted one of our sets with so much because he had so much light going on <laughs> outside it. It started. I thought, oh, I can smell smoke. It's like, oh my god, it's mel you're melting the set, and. Um, Anyway, so we had to turn the lights down. That was in the, I forgot it's called the, uh, there's a room where they go and view the sun. And it's a big glass window out onto the, onto the sun, protecting yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that set, he, he started to melt that set. Um, but anyway, so, um, yeah, so, sun, so sunshine was really great fun. And that's another, you know, another thing about, I'll tell you, uh, one of my favorite things about that, if you, if you look, there's a couple of shots in it where you'll see these really, these long corridors, yeah. Mm -hmm. and they're super silver in finish yeah so basically we were looking you know we, we didn't have an awful lot of money so we were trying to find a way to get a really interesting wall finish going on and uh, the set decorator came back with a roll of loft insulation from b and q <laughs> right. okay, which was which is if you've ever seen this stuff it's orange on one side and then when you turn it over it has silver foil on the other yeah, yeah. so when you look at the set you'll see that there is one of the corridors is completely made up of rolls of loft insulation yeah? <laughs> from B and Q, right? No, I don't look it. It looks amazing, yeah. Um, and and I think so. Sorry, I shouldn't say that about my own work, but I think I think they did a brilliant job with that. And and the funniest thing was that we bought all the stock from. We were filming in East London in Three Mill Studios, and we went to the B and Q just over there. There's a big cinema just the other side of the river. And we went to that massive B and Q depot thing or whatever it is, and we bought all their stock. Yeah, so the sort of young spotty manager has obviously gone and ordered in. <laughs> yeah, and he not thought he's having it. Uh, thought there'd been a big move on loft insulation, so he bought another <laughs> giant. So when we um, went back, <laughs> there were, there we we took all of the stock that he had, and the next time we went back, there was another. He'd got obviously <laughs> thought that. <laughs> he was onto one. He had a giant, a giant wall of it up with a big sign at the front saying, "You know, oh, <laughs> special <man>. offer." <laughs> uh, anyway, um, yeah. What else about sunshine? Um, would no, you, would you just, make a, a model of the whole, the whole spaceship beforehand? Would you make a, and would you, yeah. would you still film using a model, or is that very? Yeah, no, we did actually. So in that film, um, yeah. So in the process of, in the process of making. Uh, of making the spaceship we was it, obviously the spaceship was too big to ever build as one piece so the only way we ever saw the spaceship was that we we did a model of it and in fact we built uh, i think it was the beginning of 3d printers so we actually printed some of it we printed a version of it um and these model makers so actually in that film it was it was um there was a sort of resurgence back to you know you know when when Star Wars went a bit insane on CG yeah, I don't yeah. know, like it lost its way yeah um, so there was a resurgence back to um, to physical you know because in reality that's obviously again the the best way to do something even if it's a a model the best way is to have a physical model because the atoms and light and everything reflect off it like a normal thing even though it's small so. Um, or rather than having someone make up how the light looks on a thing, you know. And so we we did go back to using some some physical models. So we built a model of the ship, which we filmed with motion control cameras. So basically you do a number of different passes past the same model. So it's a it's a one third scale model, so it still filled the studio. Obviously, yeah, yeah, big yeah, pieces. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So when you see when you see the um, when you see them, um, they have to leap from one ship to another. I've forgotten what we called that set, but um, the airlock. Yeah. When yeah. you watch that airlock, that is a complete model. That airlock, and um, we built it and motion controlled it. But then in motion control, it's complicated and super slow because you have to add layers on. So you do your first pass mechanically. And then you do another pass, and this time you add smoke in. So you do a clean one, and then some right, smoke. Okay, yeah, yeah. But the difficulty is that 
unfortunately a bit like a bit like digital photography now everyone takes their own photographs and edits them on and recolors them you know, in the old days you used to have to go to a, you know you take a photo on film and print it and then yeah. whatever so what 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 the score is with with um, with cg is that the directors can change their mind now so you can shoot the thing yeah once you've got the model built in in in, in cg and in, in, you can then move wherever you like around that model so you can change your shot Whereas what we did with the motion control meant you were locked into using that particular particular shot. And um, that becomes difficult in post if you don't like it or it's not working. Yeah, yeah. So although the quality of that image and the, the, is more beautiful probably than any CG work, uh, it's technically difficult to change. So, so I think in the end we did a bit of both. We had we had a lot of models and then we adjusted them in post. You know, we did right. we did work to them. So, and that's now quite common, which is that people, you know, on on the, on these bigger movies now do do a lot more models. Uh, certainly, in the last Star Wars, they did a lot more models, and and then they they tend to treat them with a little bit of post. So it's a sort of more balanced approach. Okay. But yeah, that's um, yeah. So so we built we built models of the set, shot models of the set. Yeah, so when you're when you're designing it, you 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 um, it's quite it's quite tricky when you're designing something that large, because um, you know you you can never really get the scale up, and drawing it yeah. up is like yeah. a nightmare. So you, you you draw it up on a big sheet of paper, and it's still minuscule, you know. So you can't right. get to the detail. Um, but then we blew up sections of it and worked on them, and then gave. So in the end, the art department, my department, gave the CG department a sort of um, a bible of how we want these things to look because they obviously work for months after we finish and they're yeah. continuing to develop these things so they had a bible so they could go back and look at our textures and our finishes and all the rest of right yeah, yeah yeah amazing what about because uh a lot of my students if they've seen any one of your films it would be 28 days later i think because it it's got that iconic opening scene how do you do that? How do you go about? I mean, oh, no, no. So the, this is honestly the truth about that. So Alex Garland wrote the script for that, the yeah. one that I said it wasn't so good. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 um, the opening sequence was like, uh, what do we say? It's like it was like a sort of Armageddon chaos in yeah. London with buses burnt out and things everywhere. You know, it was like yeah. our buildings. It was like horrendous carnage. So when we read that, like we sat down and we looked at the budget, you just go, what? No, no chance. Yeah. Not, not to do it well, anyway. You know, you, you just end up, end up looking a mess. And so we just, one day, I can't remember how it came about. I think we just, Danny and I were just chatting. And we said, what about if we just did nothing, like emptied the, the city? That would be cool, wouldn't it, to try and empty yeah. the city? And we weren't, obviously, when you look into it, we're not the first people to do a film about empty cities and streets but it really um it was actually more powerful than the, than i think more powerful to find a city that you know is your own town your own city you know it's buzzing to find that totally empty and weird than finding it full of carnage with planes crashing and everything else um so yeah so the the idea of it being empty came about and then the problem of how to do that you know which was basically right. we had to get so in those days, we were working with tiny little cameras, which is, it was interesting. You'll see the film's quite, this is quite, there's some quite interesting camera uh, techniques yeah. and it's quite fuzzy and it's done with a one, a one, how was it called? A one G, um, a very small Sony camera that was like, you know, would be now very, very, up, very, up. I, I, look, I looked back at it the other day and I was shocked about how grainy the footage is. Yeah, it's really yeah. grainy. So it doesn't I hold up. These days, yeah. it's and and we chose we chose that camera and I and I, I don't want to go off, off 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 the story here but we chose that camera so that we could be more agile and quicker and move but basically we had about ten of them yeah because you could like in normal film cameras you know you struggle to get you know well when you're on a big budget you can have a, you know, quite a few but you know normally it's like one camera and a, another possibly two cameras max so this was us we got 10 cameras so everyone became a like a camera person I, I, I was on one camera on a rooftop because we decided to film at like half past two in the morning and just wait till the street was empty and then go for it and try and do our yeah. thing 
but inevitably like uh, the truth of the matter is that london never closes down so there's always a half a dozen revelers trying to get in the scene which yeah, 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 yeah. we had to scrub them out in post in cg <laughs> various oh, yeah. people that refused <laughs> yeah refused to not go home across the bridges and wherever else but you know um and a few a few rebel taxi drivers here and there but mostly we got up at about half we got there at half two in the morning set up and then as soon as the light was good enough we turned right. over with like with multiple cameras so 10 cameras so that we had an option to to um just you know you'd probably we probably got half an hour before it became we managed to hold everything up for half an hour and then it became chaos again you know so we we had to give up and come back the next morning um but yeah each time we had to dress that bridge with bric-a-brac and rubbish and everything it was quite a number i have to say i remember thinking oh my god so we could at least get this open and done with um, and the other mad bit of that, the next bit is he goes to the mall where he passes the bus, double decker bus. Yeah, on on his side, side, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, so I can't understand how this happened, but someone told us that we were only allowed. So there's only half a bus there in reality. The next, the top half of the bus is CG and the, right. the wheels and the undercarriage. So we had to get a bus, cut the bus in half <laughs> and deliver it, yeah, in half. And then yeah. when we got there, the guy that runs the, because we thought the council said this was the only way you had to allow um, fire brigades and certain people to get past. You couldn't block the road. This was their thing, Westminster Council. Anyway, then I'm talking to the head of the council these days. Very excited in the morning with his cup of coffee on set. Really great. He said, just don't, Mark, just tell me something. I just don't understand. Why, why is there only half of a bus? <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. So I called, I said, well, the reason it's cut in half is because we were told that you said that we can only have eight foot wide, not eight foot width. Right. Is that ridiculous? Who said that? Anyway, it was like one of these things. You go, oh, I can't believe this. You spent yeah. <laughs> ten grand cutting the bus in half, you know, <laughs> and then had to put it back on again afterwards. But um, yeah, and and so yeah, no, no, and that's a really interesting. I mean, there's some nice. I often think that. Um, when you know this business when you're working with danny he has these uh, these these visual ideas yeah so um he his his thought and i think this is a really good one in terms of design it, there's one scene where you're on a rooftop of the flats where a couple uh, a father and daughter are, are held up yeah and there's yeah. and they go onto the roof and it's covered so basically this father has there is um in order there's no running water clear clean water so in order for him to get water he's taken every single receptacle from the tower block from a beaker plastic cup to a washing bowl whatever else and put it on the roof yeah and i remember so danny was talking about this idea and we said yeah no and we went up there with like um i think we probably had to start with about 500 buckets yeah and this is classic danny Boyle. he went no he said no no i said well okay so what what, what do you think he said I think if that's 500, I think 2,000. <laughs> two, right, two, you want 2,000 buckets, okay, so plastic things. <laughs> so um, we spent the entire afternoon just traveling, traveling around East London to Tupperware shops, yeah, and, you, and, and going into the guy and just saying the hardware shop, listen, mate, how many of these plastic things have you got? And, he, he's, and then I said, well, we'll take everything. He said, what do you mean you take everything? No, I said, every single piece of plastic you got, give it to us. <laughs> Put it in the van. So we bought these these guys. They must have thought, what on earth is happening? Um, anyway, so yeah, we arrived and then completely covered that ceiling. But it's a really interesting story beat, I think, when you think about how people survive. And it's a very arresting image. You know, it's a very unusual image to see you wonder what on earth it feels like a damien hurst installation or something right like yeah yeah, yeah. it's also color in it as well yeah that, the yeah. color isn't it? Dark, yeah. Though. yeah but so so it's sort of a really brilliant i think it's a really clever danny's idea it's a really clever uh visual idea for a film that tells a story you know the the, the 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 reality of it is that's what you would do is you'd have to go down and, and work away at collecting water and it would be plastic tupperware etc from the block of flats cool uh, you, were you in the film did you cameo as a zombie in that film sorry is it an infected or whatever we call it yeah um 
No, I don't think. No, I don't think I was a zombie. Um, no, I've cameoed in many films, but I don't think in 28 Days I cameoed as a zombie. Although I would have loved to have done. Yeah. Crikey, yeah, that would have been fun. Uh, one um, of those ones on fire. No, I'm refusing to admit that I was a zombie in that film. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you there are a couple of them that look like me. For sure. Right. Yeah. I, I thought I had heard you were in the um, in the tunnel at one point. One of those running after them. Oh yeah. No. No. Maybe I was. Yeah. Maybe I was. Yeah. And maybe maybe it was. I was. Yeah, it's that long was, ago. Yeah. How many years ago is that? It's quite a few uh, years ago. 2002, I think, isn't it? There you go. So probably. So all right then. Yeah. I did. <laughs> I think I did run through the tunnel. I certainly tried it out for sure. Yeah, Crazy yeah, yeah. that was. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, all right, so what is then the difference between working on those kind of films, which are, I guess, l relatively low budget anyway, compared to something like yeah. the most, re most recent film, Bond, right? No Time to Die. That's yeah. got to be a different experience altogether. Yeah, yeah, they are very, very different experiences because um, uh, the same principles apply, you know, the same, the same principles apply, except, yeah, as you say, on the bond, you, you have resources. I always think, if I'm honest, that my, um, you know, I, you'll know, because I used to work with your dad, and um, when we had no resource, and we worked in the theatre, and we had no money, and mm. I think that's, the, that's, the, that's a really interesting thing to remember, actually, that the, um, somehow, the limitation on resources, gets the mind to be a bit more alert than think right. differently. So yeah. I would say that if you spoke, if you asked Danny the same question, he would say that our best work, a lot of people say your best work is when you're young, but it, it, sometimes your best work is when you have a limited palette, when someone yeah. gives you three pens rather than a whole, a whole, um, a whole uh, array of colors. The limit, limitations sometimes just make you have to think your way out of things. And then you do things that other people don't expect because you were forced to do them. You know, you didn't have any, like that, that opening of that sequence you, in 28 days. Um, people talk about it all the time, much more than they would have ever if we'd scattered loads of stuff yeah. in the street and burnt out tanks. So, you know, in a way, um, there's, there's the, the, the thing about, the thing when you're doing a bigger film is to try and keep light on your feet and still, you know, not just fall into the classic thing of what you can afford to do it. Uh, therefore, you just get on and, and, and do it. You know, try try and keep things imaginative. I'm always trying to think of uh, like arresting images that would burn onto your retina, and when you leave a film, that you that's something that night that would, as you, you know, relax that night. Some image from that film would come up and into your head. You couldn't resist. You could blast through. So I think that's the thing. Is trying to think of those, and you think. So you should te I test myself when I'm, I'm drawing up things and thinking about things. I think, is that any good? No, so that's really boring and rubbish. So yeah, yeah. tear it up and start again. Is it, is it true you guys blew up the James Bond set? Is that your fault? Not my fault directly, uh, um, but yeah. Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, this, the history of this Bond movie was, uh, I started working with Danny Boyle. Yeah. And I've, I've been working on that film for two, two and a bit years, yeah, since the first, we first, started. and in fact, we started to build sets. We had a rocket, a 350 foot rocket being built in the Bond stage. And we had a gulag, a Russian gulag going up in the mountains in Canada uh, when it all came to a standstill. Um, and so what I'm trying to say is that we had the Bond stage on hire. Now, you don't want to know how much it costs to hire the bond stage for a week. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's not even, it's money that you don't want to know about. It's not nutcase figures. So we basically had to start using it. Yeah. To make it pay. So we basically, one half of it was a construction workshop. Mm -hmm. So we didn't have to hire another construction workshop because we already had committed to paying for that space. And the other half, we put, we put, it was tiny, we just put a little set in there. So we built a really tiny set inside this enormous space. Yeah. Right. Now, if you go inside the Bond stage, it, has, it was built for, uh, for um, Octopussy, I think, where they put, the, is it the submarine one, where they built the big submarine base? It yeah. was specially built for that, because so, it burnt down before right? uh, on another Bond movie. So this, <laughs> this, this, has a, this has a tank which fills with water. 
in the middle. So it's like a, basically a concrete tank. It's really huge. It's almost the size of the stage. And, um, and we put our tiny little set in the middle of that and blew it up. Yeah. But what we didn't account for was that the explosion would ricochet off of the concrete walls of the tank, yeah, (laughs) driving the force of the blast north, which would then take the roof of the bond stage apart, yeah. (laughs) And um, so, yeah, there were some miscalculations, (laughs) and uh, and so the roof blew up, and the sides, the tops of it blew out. I mean, it literally blew. I was looking at it out the window, like it blew out in front of us it was like wow yeah um and it wasn't a huge explosion but um anyway so we had to quickly mend the bond stage so that we could continue working in there and that was a yeah so we unfortunately we did blow it up yeah and that's um <laughs> but we didn't burn it down we did manage to get it back working quite quickly do, do you have um because on Bond, of course, they they're going to have a lot of the sets already. Is there you would use sets they've already got, even though you're the designer on this film, or is it that you get kind of? No, they don't it? really. Um, the only set that they had, which we used, um, and and it is fun because everyone gives it its own twist. Yeah, is M's office, right? Which yeah. is the classic office with um, in MI6, where he has the sort of antique table and and um leather chairs and stuff yeah and that's the classic thing is the door i don't know in all the in all the films the studded leather door on the back of the door it's sort of studded leather so even when they built even when they did uh, in her majesty's secret service they put they put his office down on a submarine yeah and it still had the leather door there (laughs) so yeah so that leather door is iconic yeah and you have to be really quite careful about changing those things. So, but we did. We 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 changed. You'll note if you watch the films, you'll see that we revamped the colour of the leather. So the leather is a sort of more modern set of leather. It's not red and gaudy and cherry red. It's brown, like a sort of really delicious rich brown. So um, we did that, and we also added a new painting. And it's funny because the paintings, every, so now the next person is going to do the Bond movie will be looking for this painting. So we, um, yeah. we, talked to, we talked to Ray Fiennes about his character and said, you know, like with a modern day M, what do you think, you know, with the government money you would buy? And you know, so um, uh, he went for, um, no, who was it? He went for a painting from, um, I've got to say, uh, He's one of the war artists, and I can't remember his name. It will come to me in a second. Right, yeah. uh, but he basically went for this painting of, 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 the, of the war artist, which would cost, I don't know, it would cost a f- quite a few million quid. It's very, very famous. Anyway, so that's what we added. We added a new door and, and a new leather colour and a new painting. But the rest of it, like the painting behind his desk, has been the same painting for like the last, whatever, 50 years. Yeah. The same one so it goes in store and it comes out so in answer to your question that's the only uh set and then we added stuff onto that set as well we built we built the rest of mi6 we built a new look office that they come for and stuff like that so you just each person adds their little tweak but you do need to be um yeah yeah, yeah. careful <laughs> it's quite yeah no we because it's the 25th wedding anniversary of bond movies we went for uh we've gone for quite a classic look yeah so um, we have, um, let's just say that we've, we haven't copied, but we've, we've heavily lent on previous films and the designers of previous films for some of the shapes and, and stuff. You'll see when you watch the film, you'll, not, you'll go, oh, I know that. Someone's yeah, doing, yeah. I know that shape from somewhere. And it, it basically, we went through all the films and thought, well, let's just take every thing that we can find that we love. What are the best yeah. bits? You know, what's the best cars? What's the best? And we did, we used them all, so um, it'd be fun. Yeah, so the the difference between those two films, you know, big films and small films, is the, the process is exactly the same. But, yeah, in the big films, it's more difficult because you, you do tend to get lost. And, as you know, the more people spend on anything, the more people want to have a say in it. So to get yeah. 200 million quid, you end up with a number of studio executives that's that's not so true of a Bond movie because Barbara Broccoli and her family pretty much run that. Uh, mm-hmm. But 
you know, if you're doing a Marvel or something like that, you know, you've got a whole group of executives yeah. that, you know, um, want to have a say because they've got a lot of money riding on it. And um, so uh, whenever you do, like if you do Danny Boyle's films, you see that his films, they, they budget under 20 million, yeah? Because mm -hmm. that's a price where he can say, uh, I'm on my own and I will deliver you something in a number of months and that's it. Yeah, yeah. And they just, they don't even call. They come and say hello, but they don't interfere. So, you know, that's what happens. The more money you get, the more tricky the process becomes in terms yeah. of delivering. Oh, so um, you pretty much, I think, kind of answered this already with what you're saying about, like, uh, the lower the budget, actually, the more creative you can be sometimes. But all our students will, uh, at some point, be making a short film or a section of a TV program or a music video and they have to go away and do this and it's become a bit of a cliche in there that they always use the local train station and it's always set in and around their house and it all becomes a little bit tedious in the same thing year after year so we're always asking them to kind of you know be adventurous uh, be ambitious with it and stuff like that so would there be advice from you to them in terms of what they can do to do something a bit different with their film, you know, design wise. Yeah, I, well, I think, um, well, obviously it depends what the storyline is, you know, if the story is yeah. very domestic, kitchen sink, then that's trickier. But if you, um, if you're, if you're doing something a little bit more from the ground up, then, uh, I mean, I made a film with uh, a friend of mine at college mm -hmm. called, it was a space movie and I basically, I got shot out into, I performed in it, and I got, I got shot out into space in a capsule, yeah? So basically yeah. it forced us to build a model and to build a, a real set. One, we only built one set, but I think we had 47, 50 quid maximum for the whole thing. Um, so basically we did a lot of, we, we borrowed a friend's estate car, and then we went around to the skips and various places, and we pulled out cardboard tubes, and uh, anything we could find that would, would look like some sort of weird ducting on a on a it was all based around um uh blade runner really in that world so then we used some some ragged old blinds put some light through them to make a bit of interesting light you know so so yeah we, we basically gathered pieces of material and, and and tried it and i think you know even if it's a even if it's a domestic thing you could still um play with the palettes and make the color different you know you could really have a go because it's like now when you're not you've got no one looking over your shoulder you can have fun so just experiment and play and, a bit with stuff yeah and also i i mean i did two weeks with you when i was probably 13 on 28 weeks later and one of the things that stuck with me was you taking the director of that around the different locations for a council estate you needed and it was, I think you said to me at one point, look, we, we already know which one we're going for. We're just going to give him a bit of variety. Mm. And you showed him a few high rises. But then we went to the one that I think you used in the end, which is, I can't remember what it's called, but mm. very long, kind of curved, I don't know what it is, but this old brutalist architecture, whatever it is. Uh, yeah. And it's this amazing location to film in. And I just thought that selection process is quite interesting in terms of, Location. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. Because actually, you're, in in a in a small film, you probably won't be building too much because it is an expensive mm -hmm. process. But yeah, so no, I I do I think um, yeah, there's some there's some absolutely amazing things in the real world, mm -hmm. and sometimes turning them on their head as well. So you know, just using them, when I stand somewhere and think about it in a different way and think how yeah. if you just lit that differently, how would that look? Yeah, right. and yeah. also I also think sometimes you don't need to overwork things. Yeah. Sometimes the, the, you know, simple, simple, simple frames and simple lighting and, you know, keep, you can keep things very, very, I, I like to think this, Joe, that if you could tell a story with three objects rather than 15, then do that. Right. So yeah. if you could find three things to put in the image that really told you the story. So for instance, as an example, when I, when I, if you work in the theatre, and someone says to you, can you make the sea? Then a good way to do it is to get a child in a rubber ring to run and jump off the front of the stage. Yeah? Right, yeah. That says enough about 
the world that you don't need to see the sand. Yeah. You know, you can obviously have a sound effect of the sea, but I'm just saying that that, that is the thing that makes you remember what it's like to be at the seaside is to run screaming into the water and jump into it. Yeah. yeah. And so you, if you, if you think about that and ra rather than just overdress everything with loads of bric a brac, so you just can't see where you're going because there's too much in the frame. Just go right. What are the three things that tell me about this person's character? His watch, his toupee, and um, a packet of uh, pills or cigarettes. Yeah, those, those, you know, in order, these are the three things. So try and be more disciplined yeah, in, yeah. In, your, in your process. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's awesome. oh, it's a pleasure. Nice That's way good. to spend a COVID afternoon, I've got to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> No, I'm gonna, we're going to try and do a number of these because I've got, obviously, it's media studies and film studies. So I'm going to be having a look around. I want to talk to like journalists, you know, app developers, but everyone yeah. in the film industry as well. So we'll, I'll, I'll get a few of these down. I'll here. tell you what, I, what, I'm, I'm in, um, what is interesting at the moment is it's like a race to the Arctic to find the way to make a film now under the yeah. COVID realities. Yeah, yeah. So that's an interesting process is to is to do that and i think some of us are going to be pioneering it you know like i'm literally um i'm, I'm anxious about it because obviously i certainly don't want to be coughing and splattering on a ventilator anywhere ever but you know eventually we've got to try and uh, get back to normality so we're on the cusp of thinking up new ideas about how, how to how to do it yeah, with, yeah. so filmmaking is going to become a very for the for the moment until such time as we have a um a, what's it a cure what do you call it like a vaccine yeah we're going to be um having to you know if that's five years down the line we're gonna to have to make films in a different ways so yeah, there's an interesting yeah. process occurring about numbers very, how to do it sorry for the people who have been halfway through production and they're oh, gutted be yeah. nuts when they come back a year later yeah yeah. Over yeah my my friends are working on batman they 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 um they uh they're in a really heavyweight old school film process you know with masses of makeup and big yeah. sets that's not gonna you know loads of act, like the actors uh, like the extras that's not gonna happen you right know, yeah. the maximum you're gonna have is 50 people on a film and then 10 people around the camera is is the talk 10 only including the actors so you uh, new scripts new ideas folks are going to be you know start yeah. writing <laughs> Zoom the movie it will have to be yeah forget what you know now it's all different <laughs> okay. interesting all right. times though. all right yeah. yeah lovely speaking to you